Before I begin, I do want to extend a word of thanks, not only to your pastors, Paul, and your very good decision to include Debbie as part of your pastoral staff, uh, but also to the saints here in Poland. I am grateful for your presence here this morning and for your witness in this community. This church has been a cornerstone of Christian witness and mission for many, many years, and I'm grateful for that and that you have chosen to continue not only that tradition, but to expand it and to broaden it uh, and to bring God's mercies into this corner of the world. I am grateful for that. Paul mentioned that uh, my husband and I just moved from Denver, but we had all, we're only in Denver a couple of years. Most of our adult life is, was in Arkansas. So when people say Denver, they think we're all exotic and Western, and uh, we're really more uh, hillbilly and Southern. So um, just wanted to, wanted to be clear about that, okay? We loved our time in Denver, uh, but that, those were not our roots. Uh, our roots are more uh, in, the, in the hills of Arkansas. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 through 35 let us hear the word of God then Peter came to Jesus and said to him Lord if another member of the church sins against me how often should I forgive as many as seven times Jesus said to him not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison and, until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was in high school, I had a close encounter with this passage. It was during a time when I was gaining a sense of righteousness and justice. And as you know, in the hands of a teenager, that's volatile stuff. I was raised with two brothers who were one year older and one year younger than me, and a sister who was born when I was 14 years old. In my family, there was a different set of rules for the boys and the girl of a generation and the girl of another generation. That meant, of course, I was singled out to have separate rules from everyone else. So we'll forget about my baby sister because she doesn't really count, you know. She didn't make the same kind of decisions that, that we did. But here's an example. The boys could stay out until midnight, but I had to be in by 10 p.m. 
it did not matter that my friends were friends from church and the most extravagant thing that we would do is play spades, cards, at somebody's home. My younger brother actually got arrested one time, always stayed out late, ran with a rough crowd, but did he get any privileges revoked? Oh no, he was just forgiven. And if I was one minute late, I was grounded, or my allowance was taken away, or some horrible injustice, you can tell, it's still in my marrow. So in a conversation with uh, one of my youth group leaders, I told her how mad I was at my father because of this injustice and that I was not going to forgive him. And she said, you know, Jesus says to forgive 77 times. I was shocked. I, in my literal head, I was stunned that Jesus would expect us to keep track of every time we forgave someone. I mean, how does one get one's head around that? Does, it, does that mean on, on the 78th time, then you can hold it against them and you don't have to do it anymore? That's how my brain worked. So I was kind of counting up, okay, at the 78th time, then I get my righteous indignation, you know. Justified. Uh, and I said to her, okay, I, I will forgive him, but I won't forget this. And she said, Kathy, I think that's what forgiveness means, is that you forgive, and then we forget. Well, well I was double shocked. How do you keep track of the 77 times you forgive if you're supposed to forget it along the way? <laughs> I reveal this because I think it represents how many of us respond to the challenge of forgiveness. We know that God forgives us all our sin through Christ. We know that Jesus commands us to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. And we are actually able and willing to forgive on many occasions. It's just that we would like to establish a few reasonable limits here. Do we have to forgive others when they treat us badly? Should we forgive the same person, the same offense, over and over again? Does unlimited forgiveness actually help the other person? You know, we need, we need limits. We need to make certain that it's justifiable, that they deserve it. And Peter is of this mind. He says, if a brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? Seven times? You know, I think that's actually pretty reasonable of Peter. I mean, that's a lot of forgiveness in my mind. Seven. But it's not generous enough. Some translations of this passage say 70 times seven. I'll go with the 77, okay? Just for the sake of, well, human behavior. But of course, Jesus does not expect us to keep score. Jesus does not expect us to count up on a little board or in our heads or on our calculators or our iPads how many times we've forgiven a particular person. That, of course, is not the point. What he means is we are to be in the practice of forgiving and forgetting in such a way that we don't need to keep a tally in our heads. We don't need to count it against our good behavior and the other person's bad behavior. Jesus is making a point not to increase the number of times we must forgive, but to say there's no limit. In God's eyes, there is no limit to forgiveness. God continues to forgive us. And that is what we are to practice, this broad gift of forgiveness. And he underscores this point by telling this parable of, of the unforgiving servant. The servant is forgiven a great debt. I mean, it is such a great debt in that time that it would probably take 52 years to even accumulate that amount of money. So this is, what he's saying is this is, 
This is a debt that's out of sight. This guy would never be able to repay it, no matter how sincere he is. And so his Lord says, you're forgiven your debt. Then, then we turn around and the, and the servant has a fellow slave who owes a debt against him. And it's actually a small debt in comparison. But does he forgive him? No. He sends him to prison. I, I, I kind of like the friends and their righteous indignation because I, I still feel like I'm kind of in that track. So they, they don't like this, the way the slave treated his fellow slave. And they go and tell the Lord. And the Lord says, I, I forgave you a great debt and you could not forgive a small debt? I'm going to send you away to be tortured until you pay every last penny, which will not ever happen. Now then, this is a real good time not to look at this as a literal parable. Um, because that sounds pretty harsh for God to talk about torturing someone forever. We, we find that to be very harsh. But if we look at the meaning behind this, that's exactly what we're supposed to understand. The harshness of this first slave's attitude toward his brother. The harshness of withholding that gift of forgiveness. Frederick Buechner puts it this way, to forgive someone is to say one way or another, you have done something unspeakable and by all rights, I should call it quits between us. However, although I make no guarantees that I will be able to forget what you've done, and though we may both carry the scars for life, I refuse to let it stand between us. I want you for my friend. And I think that's kind of going far because the person who has done something against you, were they really a friend to begin with? Okay, so now I'm starting to pick it apart and be literal again. The point is, God's forgiveness is so vast, so deep, so powerful, that that is the lesson that we learn and that we share. That is what sets us apart as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us different from the rest of the world. I, and I know that this, this whole thing about forgiveness gets very complicated, gets very difficult. There are unspeakable things that people do to one another. And some of those things are horribly difficult to forgive and perhaps impossible to forget. This lesson tells us that God understands those deep, unspeakable horrible debts. God understands that. God understands our feelings, our deep hurt, our loneliness, our despair, and our clinging to righteous indignation. God understands that. But God does not want us to end up like the slave being tortured and repaying a debt for all eternity. And that's what we do to ourselves when we withhold forgiveness. We put ourselves in torture. We poison our own minds and our own hearts. And that's the point. God does not want us there in that place. God wants us to forgive so that we may be washed of that burden. And, and Jesus puts in 77 times because he wants us to lose count of how many times it happens. That is how we are free. That is how we make a difference in this world. So I would say, in this day and age, we are a people in need of forgiveness. And we are a people who can offer that where other people cannot, because we understand it differently. We understand it as being a sign and a mark of our Christianity, a sign and a mark of being children of God of being disciples of Jesus Christ. So we, we don't really have a choice. You know, we can hold on to it and end up in torture. Or we can forgive and participate in the great and broad mercy of Almighty God. Amen.